Good morning, matriculants. We're going to read Next Door by Kurt Vonnegut today. If you have your reader, you can open on page 123. Here we go. The old house was divided into two dwellings by a thin wall that passed on, with high fidelity, sounds on either side. On the north side were the Leonards. On the south side were the Hoggers. The Leonards, husband, wife, and eight-year-old son, had just moved in. And, aware of the war, they kept their voices down as they argued in a friendly way as to whether or not the boy, Paul, was old enough to be left alone for the evening. Shh, said Paul's father. Was I shouting? said his mother. I was talking in a perfectly normal tone. If I could hear Hager pulling a cork, he can certainly hear you, said his father. I did not say anything I'd be ashamed to have anybody hear said Mrs. Leonard. You called Paul a baby, said Mr. Leonard. That certainly embarrasses Paul, and it embarrasses me. It's just a way of talking, she said. It's a way we've got to stop, he said. And we can stop treating him like a baby too, tonight. We simply shake his hand, walk out, and go to the movie. He turned to Paul. You're not afraid, are you, boy? I'll be all right said Paul. He was very tall for his age and thin and had a soft, sleepy, radiant sweetness engendered by his mother. I'm fine. The damn right, said his father, clouting him on the back. It'll be an adventure. I'd feel better about this adventure if we could get a sitter, said his mother. If it's going to spoil the picture for you, said the father, let's take him with us. Mrs. Leonard was shocked. Oh, it isn't for children. I don't care, said Paul amiably. The way of their not wanting him to see certain movies, certain magazines, certain books, certain television shows, was a mystery he respected, even relished a little. It wouldn't kill him to see it, said Father. You know what it's about, she said. What is it about? said Paul innocently. Mrs. Leonard looked to her husband for help and got none. It's about a girl who chooses her friends unwisely, she said. Oh, said Paul, that doesn't sound very interesting. Are we going or aren't we? said Mr. Leonard impatiently. The show starts in ten minutes. Mrs. Leonard bit her lip. All right, she said bravely. You lock the windows and the back door, and I'll write down the telephone numbers for the police and the fire department and the theatre and Dr. Fay. She turned to Paul. You can dial, can't you, dear? He's been dialing for years, cried Mr. Leonard. Shh, said Mrs. Leonard. Sorry, Mr. Leonard bowed to the wall. My apologies. Paul, dear, said Mrs. Leonard, what are you going to do while we're gone? Oh, look through my microscope, I guess, said Paul. You're not going to be looking at germs, are you? She said. Nope, just hair, sugar, pepper, stuff like that, said Paul. His mother frowned judiciously. I think that would be all right, don't you? She said to Mr. Leonard. Fine, said Mr. Leonard, just as long as the pepper doesn't make him sneeze. I'll be careful, said Paul. Mr. Leonard winced. Shh, he said. Soon after Paul's parents left, the radio in the Hager apartment went on. It was on softly at first, so softly that Paul, looking through his microscope on the living room coffee table, couldn't make out the announcer's words. The music was frail and dissonant, unidentifiable. Gamely, Paul tried to listen to the music rather than to the man and woman who were fighting. Paul squinted through the eyepiece of his microscope at a bit of his hair far below, and he turned a knob to bring the hair into focus. It looked like a glistening brown eel, flecked here and there with tiny spectra where the light struck the hair just so. There, the voices of the man and woman were getting louder again, drowning out the radio. 
Paul twisted the microscope knob nervously and the objective lens ground into the glass slide on which the head rested. The woman was shouting now. Paul unscrewed the lens and examined it for damage. Now the man shouted back, shouted something awful, unbelievable. Paul got a sheet of lens tissue from his bedroom and dusted at the frosted dot on the lens where the lens had bitten into the slide. He screwed the lens back in place. All was quiet again next door, except for the radio. Paul looked down into the microscope, down into the milky mist of the damaged lens. Now the fight was beginning again, louder and louder, cruel and crazy. Trembling, Paul sprinkled grains of salt on a fresh slime and put it under the microscope. The woman shouted again, a high, ragged, poisonous shout. Paul turned the knob too hard and the fresh slide cracked and fell in triangles to the floor. Paul stood shaking, wanting to shout too, to shout in terror and bewilderment. It had to stop. Whatever it was, it had to stop. If you're going to yell, turn up the radio, the man cried. Paul heard the clicking of the women's heels across the floor. The radio volume swelled until the boom of the bass made Paul feel like he was trapped in a drum. And now, bellowed the radio, for Kathy from Fred, for Nancy from Bob, who thinks she's swell. For Arthur, from, who, from one who's worshipped him from afar for six weeks. Yes, stardust. Remember, if you have a dedication, call Milton 93000. Ask for All Night Sam, the record man. The music picked up the house and shook it. A door slammed next door. Now someone hammered on the door. Paul looked down into his microscope once more, looked at nothing, while a prickling sensation spread over his skin. He faced the truth. The man and the woman would kill each other if he didn't stop them. He beat on the wall with his fist. Mr. Hager, stop it, he cried. Mrs. Hager, stop it. For Ollie from Lavinia, all night Sam cried back at him. For Ruth from Carl, who'll never forget last Tuesday. For Wilbur from Marv, who's lonesome tonight. Here's the sort of Finnegan band asking, Love, what are you doing to my heart? Next door, crockery smashed, filling a split second of radio silence. And then the tidal wave of music drowned everything again. Paul stood by the wall, trembling in his helplessness. Mr. Hager, Mrs. Hager, please. Remember the number, said All Night Sam. Milton 93000. Dazed, Paul went to the phone and dialed the number. WJCD, said the switchboard operator. Would you kindly connect me with All Night Sam, said Paul. Ho, said All Night Sam. He was eating talking with a full mouth. In the background, Paul could hear sweet, bleating music, the original of what was rending the radio next door. I wonder if I might make a dedication, said Paul. Don't know why not, said Sam. If you belong to any organization listed as subversive by the Attorney General's office? Paul thought a moment. No, sir, I don't think so, sir. He said, shoot, said Sam. From Mr. Lemuel K. Hager to Mrs. Hager, said Paul. What's the message, said Sam. I love you, said Paul. Let's make up and start all over again. The woman's voice was so shrill with passion. that it cut through the din of the radio, and even Sam heard it. Kid, are you in trouble? said Sam. Your folks fighting? Paul was afraid that Sam would hang up on him if he found out that Paul wasn't a blood relative of the Hargers. Yes, sir, he said. 
and you're trying to pull him back together again with this dedication? said Sam. Yes, sir, said Paul. Sam became very emotional. Okay, kid, he said hoarsely. I'll give it everything I've got. Maybe it'll work. I once saved a guy from shooting himself the same way. How did you do that? said Paul, fascinated. He called up and said it was going to blow his brains out, said Sam. And I played the blue birds of happiness. He hung up. Paul dropped the telephone into its cradle. The music stopped and Paul's hair stood on end. For the first time, the fantastic speed of modern communications was real to him, and he was appalled. Folks, said Sam, I guess everybody stops and wonders sometimes what the heck he thinks he's doing with the life the good Lord gave him. It may seem funny to you folks, because I always keep a cheerful front, no matter how I feel inside, but I wonder sometimes too. And then, just like some angel was trying to tell me, Keep going, Sam, keep going. Something like this comes along. Folks, said Sam, I've been asked to bring a man and his wife back together through the miracle of radio. I guess there's no sense in kidding ourselves about marriage. It isn't any bowl of cherries. There's ups and downs and sometimes folks don't see how they can go on. Paul was impressed with the wisdom and authority of Sam. Having the radio turned up high made sense now, for Sam was speaking like the right-hand man of God. When Sam paused for effect, all was still next door. Already the miracle was working. Now, said Sam, a guy in my business has to be half musician, half philosopher, half psychiatrist and half electrical engineer. And if I've learned one thing from working with all you wonderful people out there, it's this. If folks would swallow their self-respect and pride, there wouldn't be any more divorces. There were affectionate cooings from next door. A lump grew in Paul's throat as he thought about the beautiful thing he and Sam were bringing to pass. Folks, said Sam, that's all I'm going to say about love and marriage. That's all anybody needs to know. And now, from for Mrs. Lemuel K. Hager, from Mr. Hager, I love you. Let's make up and start all over again. Sam choked up. Here's Eartha Kitt, and somebody bad stole the wedding bell. The radio next door went off. The world lay still. A purple emotion flooded Paul's being. Childhood dropped away, and he hung, dizzy, on the brink of life, rich, violent, rewarding. There was movement next door, slow foot-dragging movement. So, said the woman. Charlotte, said the man uneasily. Honey, I swear. I love you, she said bitterly. Let's make up and start all over again. Baby, said the man desperately. It's another Lemuel K. Hager. It's got to be. You want your wife back? She said, All right, I won't get in her way. She can have you, Lemuel, you jewel beyond price, you. She must have called the station, said the man. She can have you, you philandering, two-timing, two-bit lock and bear, she said. But you won't be in very good condition. Charlotte, put down that gun, said the man. Don't be anything you'll be sorry for. That's all behind me, you worm, she said. There were three shots. Paul ran out into the hall and bumped into the woman as she burst from the Hager apartment. She was a big blonde woman, all soft and awry, like an unmade bed. She and Paul screamed at the same time and then she grabbed him as he started to run. You want candy? she said wildly. Bicycle? No, thank you, said Paul shrilly. Not at this time. 
You haven't seen or heard a thing, she said. You know what happens to squealers? Yes, cried Paul. She dug into her purse and brought out a perfumed mulch of face dishes, bobby pins and cash. Here, she panted. It's yours and there's more where that came from if you keep your mouth shut. She stuffed it into his trousers pocket. She looked at him fiercely, then fled into the street. Paul ran back into his apartment, jumped into bed and pulled the covers up over his head. In the hot, dark cave of the bed, he cried because he and all night Sam had helped kill a man. A policeman came clumping into the house very soon and he knocked on both apartment doors with his billy club. Numb, Paul crept out of the hot, dark cave and answered the door. Just as he did, the door across the hall opened and there stood Mr. Hager, haggard but whole. Yes, sir, said Hager. He was a small, balding man with a hairline moustache. Can I help you? The neighbours heard some shots, said the policeman. Really, said Hager urbanely. He dampened his moustache with the tip of his little finger. How bizarre. I heard nothing. He looked at Paul sharply. Have you been playing with your father's guns again, young man? Oh, no, sir, said Paul, horrified. Where are your folks? said the policeman to Paul. At the movies, said Paul. We're all alone, said the policeman. Yes, sir, said Paul. It's an adventure. I'm sorry I said that about the guns, said Hager. I certainly would have heard any shots in this house. The walls are thin as paper, and I heard nothing. Paul looked at him gratefully. And you didn't hear any shots either, kid, said the policeman. Before Paul could find an answer, there was a disturbance out in the street. A big motherly woman was getting out of a taxi cab and wailing at the top of her lungs, Lim, Lim, baby. She barged into the foyer, a suitcase bumping against her leg and tearing her stocking to shreds. She dropped the suitcase and ran to Hager, throwing her arms around him. I got your message, darling, she said. And I did just what all night Sam told me to do. I swallowed my self-respect and here I am. Rose, 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 my little Rose, said Hager. Don't ever leave me again. They grappled with each other affectionately and staggered into the apartment. Just look at this apartment said Mrs. Hager. Men are just lost without women. As she closed the door, Paul could see that she was awfully pleased with the mess. You sure you didn't hear any shots? said the policeman to Paul. The ball of money in Paul's pocket seemed to swell to the size of a watermelon. Yes, sir, he croaked. The policeman left. Paul shut his apartment door shuffled into his bedroom and collapsed on the bed. The next voices Paul heard came from his own side of the wall. The voices were sunny, the voices of his mother and father. His mother was singing a nursery rhyme and his father was undressing him. Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John, piped his mother, went to bed with his stockings on, one shoe off and one shoe on. Diddle, diddle, dumpling, my son John. Paul opened his eyes. Hi, big boy, said his father. You went to sleep with all your clothes on. How's my little adventurer, said his mother. Okay, said Paul sleepily. How was the show? It wasn't for children, honey, said his mother. You would have liked the short subject, though. It was all about bees, cunning little cubs. Paul's father handed her Paul's trousers and she shook them out and hung them neatly on the back of a chair by the bed. She patted them smooth and felt the ball of money in the pocket. Little boy's pockets, she said delighted, full of childhood's mysteries, an enchanted frog, 
A magic pocket knife from a fairy princess? She caressed the lump. He's not a little boy. He's a big boy, said Paul's father. And he's too old to be thinking about fairy princesses. Paul's mother held up her hands. Don't rush it. Don't rush it. When I saw him asleep there, I realized all over again how dreadfully short childhood is. She reached into the pocket and sighed wistfully. Little boys are so hard on clothes, especially pockets. She brought out the ball and held it under Paul's nose. Now, would you mind telling Mommy what we have here? She said gaily. The ball bloomed like a frowsy chrysanthemum with ones, fives, tens, twenties and lipstick-stained Kleenex for petals. And rising from it, befuddling Paul's young mind, was the pungent mask of perfume. Paul's father sniffed the air. What's that smell? he said. Paul's mother rolled her eyes. Taboo, she said. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a reading of Next Door. The next lesson will be an analysis of Next Door and then please watch this space or your WhatsApp group or Edmodo. I'm going to post the questions as well as the vocabulary test. Please, if you have not become part of the Edmodo English Fall team, please do so and then enjoy the rest of your day and good luck. Please stay academically fit. Have a great one, grade 12s.